Hello everyone, welcome to this presentation about the message beyond the stars. It is about the spirit of prophecy. So let's start. Scientists have recently undertaken a $100 million initiative in the search for extraterrestrial intelligence. For decades, human researchers have used massive radio telescopes to listen for non-random signals coming from intelligent civilizations beyond Earth. And what if the preferred means of but what if the preferred means of data transmission across the galaxies is optical instead of radio waves? The new initiative will not only use more sensitive radio telescopes, but will also use optical telescopes that laser beams being used as communication might be discoverable as well. Perhaps there will be someone out there trying to send a message to us. In fact, there is evidence that a message has been beaming to Earth for thousands of years now, but few are listening to it. It's a message from the Creator of this planet, a message of love from God trying to win back His rebellious children. God and humanity haven't always been separated. There was a time when mankind enjoyed face-to-face -face communication with our Creator. This was God's intention when He created us. We were made <clears throat> as social beings in His image with the capacity for relationship with the King of the universe. But sad to say, this relationship of love and trust lasted only for two chapters of the Bible. Genesis chapter 3 tells of a tragic story. Adam and Eve disregarded God's command and ate of the forbidden tree. They rebelled against God's authority, even though everything he asked of them was out of perfect love for them. And soon they discovered the awful reality that sin and God are incompatible. Sin separates us from God. Because of sin, Adam and Eve could no longer have face-to-face -face communication with their Creator. The Bible says, Genesis 3, 8, And they heard the sound of God, the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. And Adam hid, and Adam and Eve hid from God. They didn't want to see him. They didn't want to talk to him. That's what sin does. It separates us from our Heavenly Father and shatters loving relationships between God and us, between others as well and us. The prophet Isaiah wrote in Isaiah 59 too, But your iniquities have separated you from God, and your sins have hidden his face from you. Isaiah 59 too. But while sin separated humanity from God's direct presence, it couldn't separate us from his love. Love always finds a way to keep in touch, and God found a way to still communicate with his sinful, with sinful humanity. The Lord's persistence in finding ways to communicate with his people is one of the ways he tells us, I love you, I care about you, and I have a plan to help and save you. Sometimes God spoke by impressing people's minds through the Holy Spirit, sometimes by angels sent on special missions, and at other times through men and women he selected to be his messengers. He called Moses, Miriam, Samuel, Elijah, Hulda, Deborah, Isaiah, Jeremiah, and many others. He chose them to be his prophets and prophetesses, spokesperson of God. In fact, the channel of communication most frequently chosen by God was that of prophets and prophetesses, men and women who spoke for God through a special calling from heaven. This shouldn't be too surprising, for Bible clearly says, in Amos 3, 7, Surely the Lord does nothing unless He reveals His secrets to His servants, the prophets. Let's notice how these prophets receive their messages. In 2 Peter 1, 21, For prophecy never came by the will of man, but holy men of God spoke as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. Some of the prophets wrote books, which we can still read today, but others didn't. The gift of prophecy was even used by God before the flood in Noah's day. Jude 14, Now Enoch, the seventh from Adam, 
prophesied about this man also saying, Behold, the Lord comes with 10,000 of his saints. Enoch is the first person mentioned in the Bible who had the gift of prophecy. Noah, another prophet, foretold the destruction of the world by flood 120 years before it occurred. But there were others. The Bible says in Acts 3.21, God had spoken by the mouth of all his holy prophets since the world began. After the flood, we find many prophets and prophetesses, including William, Deborah, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, Daniel, and others. They were teachers of righteousness. They were moral and spiritual guides, speaking on God's behalf. God revealed His image, His message to them through visions and dreams. The Lord said in Numbers 12, 6, If there is a prophet among you, I, the Lord, make myself known to him in a vision. Numbers 12, 6. Sometimes the message the prophet received would be shared orally. Sometimes it would be enacted or written out. The Bible, in fact, is a product of the ministry of prophets. Every one of them was a part of God's plan to show his love to his earthly children. He wants us to know how much he loves us. He wants us to know about the time he is waiting for when we can be reunited and communicate face to face again. The authors of the New Testament, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Paul, Pe Peter, James, and Jude, were all part of that plan. All received the gift of prophecy <clears throat> so that they could contribute to the Bible, God's love letter to humanity. Of course, there were others living during that same time who also were given the prophetic gift but whose work is not included in the pages of the Bible. Simon, Agabus, Barnabas, and Anna all had the gift of prophecy. The deacon Philip had four daughters who prophesied in Acts 21, 9. All were instruments used by God to reveal His will and to encourage the Christian church. Of course, the greatest revelation of God's love for humanity was when Jesus came personally, demonstrated to personally demonstrate by words and action what God is really like. Never had the world witnessed a more eloquent communicator of God's love and concern, but not everyone accepted the message. Jesus was crucified on Calvary for our sins. The Bible tells us that when Jesus returned to heaven, he gave gifts to his followers, gifts that would strengthen and encourage them. Ephesians 4.8 Therefore, he says, when he ascended on high, he led ca captivity captive and gave gifts to men. What are these gifts? The Bible tells us in Ephesians 4.11. And he gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors, and teachers. Why did Jesus choose to give gifts to the church? Ephesians 4.12. For the equipment, equipping of the church for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, Ephesians 4.12. How long will these gifts be intended to remain in the church? Till the end of the unity of faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, Ephesians 4.13. Unto a perfect man, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, verse 13. So these gifts and the and the knowledge of God and that they bring are intended to give the church and its members strength and stability. That we should no longer be children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the trickery of men in the cunning craftiness of deceitful plotting. And notice where the gift of prophecy stands in the list of spiritual gifts, as Paul called them, and God has appointed this in the church, first apostles, Second, prophets, 1 Corinthians 12, 28. The gift of prophecy was second only to that of apostleship. So it was to be the very, a very important and necessary gift to help the church function properly. Paul compared the gifts of the Spirit to the various parts of the human body. He insisted that just like other our human bodies have parts that are needed and essential, so the body of Christ, the church, had been given different gifts all of which are necessary for efficient and harmonious function. And the prophets 
are a part of this vision of the church as God shows them his will as well as future events. This is a very important gift. Rebbe Proverbs 29.18 says, Where there is no revelation, the people cast off restraint. But happy is he that keeps the law. But you say, what happened to the gift of prophecy after Christ returned to heaven and all his disciples died? Not many generations passed until the church became careless, compromising, and faithful to God and his law. Jeremiah records the effect that apostasy had on the gift of prophecy when God's people were unfaithful. Jeremiah Lamentations 2.9 The law is no more, and her prophets no longer find visions from the Lord. As the early church adopted pagan rites and practices and forgot to discard fund and forgot or discarded for them fundamental truths of the Bible, one by one spiritual gifts disappeared. During the darkest days of the church's apostasy, known as the Dark Ages, Dark Ages Bibles were chained to the monastery walls so that only the clergy could read them. It was illegal for the common people to own or read scriptures. The Bible that did exist were either in the original languages of Hebrew and Greek or in Latin and the language used in churches' services of that, of that time. Only the priests were allowed to read and interpret the Bible. A few faithful Christians remained true to the Bible and its truths, and some of these even possessed copies of the Bible in languages they could read and understand. At great personal risk, they would copy and share the portions of scriptures they possessed. They planted the seeds of the Reformation long before Wycliffe, Luther, and Huss. As the Reformation began to grow in influence, Luther and others translated the Bible into the common languages of the people. Persecution came, but it only caused a greater desire for God's word. And as people began to diligently search the scriptures, all truths hidden for centuries were discovered. These truths were brought to the attention of the people, and a great religious awakening resulted. Each bold reformer built on the foundation of the previous as generations of biblical ignorance gave way to thinking that is the harmony of God's word. Eventually, a new religious movement began with Christianity, a movement of individuals who were studying the prophecies of Daniel and the Revelation and discovered that Jesus was coming soon. These devout Christians became Baptist, Methodists, came from Baptists, Methodists, Presbyterians, and many other backgrounds. They were searching the scripture and earnestly praying for light. As they studied the Bible, they discovered in the fourth commandment of God, the great memorial of his creation, a day that God asked his people to remember. They read the description of God's last day people in the book of Revelation. Here is the patience of the saints. Here are those who keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. Revelation 14, 12. As they continued to study, they were impressed that keeping the commandments of God included, included keeping the Bible Sabbath. And they began sharing the Sabbath truth with the world. Step by step, they began rediscovering the teachings of Jesus and the early Christian church teachings which had been lost sight of during the long centuries of spiritual darkness. But what about the gift of prophecy? Shouldn't this spiritual gift be present in the last day church as it was in the early day church? Notice what the prophet Joel had said would happen in the last days. In Joel 228-31. And it shall come to pass after the word that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh, and your sons and daughters shall prophesy, your old men shall dream dreams, your young men shall see visions before the coming of the great and awesome day of the Lord. Notice that God said this would take place just prior to the great and awesome day of the Lord, or just before the second coming of Christ. God's people are have to have the gift of prophecy in the midst in their midst during the closing hours of Earth's history. Communicating with the church at Corinth, Paul made this statement concerning God's followers in 1 Corinthians 1, 7, so that you come short in no gift, eagerly waiting for the revelation of our Lord Jesus Christ. And Revelation describes God's last day people as being blessed with this gift as well. Revelation 12, 17, And the dragon was enraged with the woman, and he went 
to make war with the rest of his offsprings who, offspring who keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. Later in Revelation, it is made clear that this testimony of Jesus Christ is the spirit of prophecy. According to the Bible's last book, Earth's last day people will be characterized by having the faith of Jesus, keeping the commandments of God, and having the gift of prophecy. A God of love still wants to communicate to his children, even in the last days. But you may ask, what about deception? How can we tell the difference between a genuine prophet and a false prophet? False prophets are people claiming to speak for God, but really teaching error. They have existed ever since there was a need of a true prophet to convey God's message. We don't need to be concerned about the false prophets, however, as long as we know how to recognize the genuine prophet. Let's look at some of the tests the Bible gives us for separating the true from the false. A prophet's message will be in complete harmony with the word of God and his law. Isaiah 8.20 says, To the law and to the testimony, if they speak not according to this word, it is because there is no light in them. A prophet's predictions must come to pass or be fulfilled. Jeremiah 28, 9. And when the word of the prophet come to pass, the prophet will be known as the one whom the Lord has truly sent. A, prophet's, a true prophet's message edifies the church. 1 Corinthians 14, 3 to 4. But he who prophesies speaks edification and exhortation and comfort to men. But he who prophesies edifies the church. 1 Corinthians 13, 3 and 4. One of the reasons God has given the gift of prophecy is to build up his church. If we are to discover the true gift, we must discover God's true church. One does not exist without the other. A true prophet will exalt Christ as the Son of God and the Savior of mankind. 1 John 4, 1 and 2. Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits whether they be of God, because many false prophets have gone out into the world. <clears throat> every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is of God. See? A true prophet will exalt Christ as the Son of God and the Savior of mankind. Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but the test the spirit whether they be of God, because many false prophets have gone out into the world. Every spirit that confesses Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is of God. <clears throat> A true prophet can be known by his or her life. Matthew 7, 16-18 You will know them by their fruits. A good tree cannot bear bad fruit, nor a bad tree cannot bear good fruit. Based on these texts, it is obvious that not everyone who professes to be a prophet of God is a true prophet. So when you find someone who claims to speak for God, apply these tests. If they pass the test of scripture, thank God for sending his gift of prophecy to us. If they don't pass all the tests, follow Christ's warning to watch out for them. But what about Bible's predictions that God's last day church will once again be characterized by the gift of prophecy? Let me share with you the rest of the story. As successive reformers learned new truths, eventually a movement of Bible students came to discover the truth about the second coming, and Jesus' return would mark the end of the world as we know it. In the 19th century, these believers from nearly every denomination began to conclude that the prophetic points toward the return of Christ in their lifetime. As they continued to study, they settled on a date which they expected him to return on October 22, 1844. That day, however, passed without the glorious return of Jesus and the end of the world. It was a bitter disappointment. The believers were ridiculed and scorned. But some of those who had looked and longed for the advent of Christ continued studying their Bibles. They became convicted that the date they had so carefully agreed upon was correct. But the event that they were expecting was wrong. They had understood that the sanctuary that was to be cleansed, as described in Daniel 8.14, was the earth. Now they realized that instead of the earth being destroyed by fire on that day, the verse was foretelling the cleansing of the sanctuary in heaven. 
This involves the final demonstration of God's character of love through his people. Excitedly, the believers continued to study and began to find more truths that had been forgotten for many centuries. And it was this, at this crucial moment that God chose to restore the gift of prophecy to his people. It is a fascinating story. He chose a frail 17-year-old girl and gave her a vision of the triumph of God's cause. Ellen Harmon was given her first vision in December 1844, soon after the Great Disappointment. She was shown that the Advent people traveling an elevated road to heaven with a brilliant light from Jesus illuminating the pathway. What an encouragement this was to a small scattered group of Advent believers who would later become known as Seventh-day Adventists. Young Ellen soon married James White, another youthful Bible student. And for more than 70 years, she spoke, wrote, taught, and counseled for God. Although the scope of her ministry and exper expertise is astounding, her greatest work, as she puts, was to lead men and women to the greater light, the Bible, she wrote. Little heed is given to the Bible, and the Lord has given a lesser light to lead men and women to the greater light. Culture Ministry, page 135. Throughout her writings and ministry, she championed the Holy Scriptures as the final authority in all doctrinal questions. To some who were criticizing the Word of God, she wrote, Cling to your Bible as it reads, and stop your criticism in regard to its validity, and obey the Word. Not one of you will be lost. Selected Messages, Volume 1, page 18. No female author has even written as much as Ellen White. Her messages of counsel and reproof received <clears throat> from God were shared with his people through books, magazine articles, tracts, pamphlets, and personal letters. Her writings include counsel on victorious Christian living, diet, health, prenatal drugs, uh, prenatal care, drugs, marriage, and the home, child guidance, education, and much, much, much more. Many of her writings have been supported by modern scientific discoveries. She has been quoted by professors, doctors, news commentators, and authors, and as accurate authority in many of these and as an accurate authority in many of these fields. Long before studies, studies proved its value, she advanced, advanced the beliefs of a plant-based diet. In 1898, she wrote, "In a short time, it will not be safe." To use anything that comes from animal creation, counsels to diet and foods, page 40, uh, 411. Dr. Colin Campbell of Cornell University and owner of the China study said the following, I am not aware of anyone who has more point on point than Ellen White. Given her background, she is a truly amazing woman. I am convinced that almost 100% of her statements are now substantially supported by scientific evidence that has been developed during the past two or three decades. Colin, Camp Colin Campbell, email to Don McIntosh, February 24, 2005. Statement is repeated in a public interview. As far back as 1864, Ellen White wrote, Tobacco is a poison and the most deceitful and malignant kind. It is all the more dangerous because its effects upon the system are so slow and scarcely Perceivable. Councils on Health, page 84. When she wrote that it was that it was thought that cigarette and cigar smokers were an effective care for lung disease. When she wrote that, it was thought that cigarette and cigar smoke were an effective cure for lung disease. It wasn't until 1957 that the American Cancer Society and the American Heart Association concluded that smoking was a causative factor in lung cancer. Proven. In 1902, Ellen White warned that San Francisco and Oakland would soon experience the Lord's judgment because they were becoming like Sodom and Gomorrah. At 5.12 a.m. on April 18, 1906, the great San Francisco earthquake occurred. Her predictions had come true, and devastating destructions took place as foretold. Ellen White's achievements are all more astounding when we consider that incredible obstacles and handicaps which confronted her and prevented her formal education. 
Born in 1827 in the little town of Gorham, Maine, Ellen and her twin sister Elizabeth were the last of eight children. At the age of nine, an accident forever changed her life. While walking home from school, Ellen was seriously injured by a stone thrown by a classmate. For three weeks, she was unconscious and it appeared that she would not live long. Though she did survive, she was unable to continue her schooling beyond third grade. Her suffering led her to consider her spiritual life, and she came to exercise personal faith in Jesus. Ellen became an avid, avid student of the Bible. She attended camp meetings, revivals, cottage meetings. After attending a Methodist camp meeting in Buxton, Maine, Ellen was baptized on June 26, 1842. She became a member of the Methodist Church. Later, Ellen and her family attended some meetings held in Portland, Maine. The speaker was William Miller, a Baptist farmer and a former military captain. He was the one heading the, leading the Bible students who was advocating the soon coming of Jesus Christ. His followers were labeled as Adventists or Millerites. Ellen's family was convicted of the truthfulness of Miller's message. Letter 3, 1847. After I had a vision and God gave me light, he bade me to deliver it, but I shrunk from it. I was young and I thought they would not receive it from me. But despite the feeling is feeling inadequate and physically incapable of the responsibilities of the calling, in faith she accepted the calling of God that would occupy her for the rest of her life. Ellen and her husband James worked tirelessly together to share the light they had received from God. Their triumphs and their struggles are apparently in many of her writings. Throughout her life, Ellen White was committed as a committed Christian, her tireless servant, a tireless servant of God, and a devout Ted mother. She was loved by her husband, her family, and thousands around the world. On August 6, 1881, James died in Battle Creek. Michigan, Ellen stood by his graveside and pledged to press on the work which for over 35 years they had sacrificed and suffered for. She would work alone for another 34 years, sharing some of her most beautiful and inspiring writings during this time. Her prophetic ministry took her around the world as she guided and counseled through the founding of numerous educational and health institutions. The life and labors of Ellen White closed on July 6, 1915. She was over 87 years old. She was buried beside James in Oak Hill Cemetery in Battle Creek. After a few weeks after her death, a newspaper carried his, this statement. She showed no spiritual pride and she sought no filthy locker riches. She lived the life and did the work of a worthy prophetess. The most admirable uh, of the American, the most admirable of the American succession, according to New York Independent, August 23, 1915. Though her pen was stilled, her priceless work lived on through her books. They still provide counsel, admonition, instruction, encouragement to God's people today. Her legacy is a gift of love, a message to earth from across the universe, from a God of love who still wants to keep in touch with his children. Her love her words tell of a loving God who longs to be reunited with his children. A number of years ago, in the vast desert waste of Bikwa Bichuanala, South Africa, lived a primitive bushman named Sukuba. He lived in an isolated life as a member of a nomadic people. One winter night, he crept into his shelter and prepared to sleep. But suddenly, the night became brighter than day. A shining being appeared to him and told him, to find the people of the book. Book. He must find the people who worship God. Sumuka wasn't sure what that meant. A book. How could he read it if he found it? The language of the Bushman contained clicks and guttural sounds that were quite unlike the language of other African tribes. It had, ne it had never been reduced to writing. But this shining one, as Sukuba called, the angel who appeared to him and said, the book talks you will be able to read it. Scuba rebuilt for days, traveled for days with his family in search of the book. He read, he reached the hut of some Bantu farmers and asked if they knew of the people with the book. The tribesmen were startled to hear the Bushman 
somehow speaking his Bantu language, he immediately took Sukuba to his pastor. The pastor was deeply moved by Sukuba's story and he said, your journey is over. Sukuba was very happy. But that night, the Shining One appeared to him again. He said that these were not the people he was looking for. He, he must find the Sabbath-keeping church and Pastor Moye. Pastor Moye would have a book and also four brown books that are really nine. <laughs> four brown books that are really nine. The next day, Sukuba prayed for a sign. He needed some direction for his journey. When he did, a cloud appeared in the sky. Sukuba set off after it and followed it for several days. It disappeared over a certain village. Then there Sukuba asked for Pastor Moye and was quickly, quickly directed to his home. After Sukuba told the story in the local dialect, Pastor Moye brought out his worn Bible. That's it? Sukuba exclaimed. That is it. That, but where are the four books? That are really nine. Well, as it turned out, Ellen White, years before, had written nine volumes of instruction to God's church called Testimonies for the Church. In one of the printings, this had been bound into four volumes, and the pastor Moi had this edition. Sukuba's search was over. He had found the people of the book. He had found the Sabbath keeping people, a people blessed with the prophetic gift. Eventually, he and his family accepted Christ and were baptized. He became a missionary to his own people. God is working in marvelous ways today to lead men and women to his time, uh, end time message. The fact that you are hearing this story is no accident. Like Tsukuba, you are being guided, my friend. God is guiding you into his truth. God is giving you courage to face the future. Perhaps you've been searching for truth for years. I believe You've been divinely guided to this destination. You, like Sukuba, can claim this is God, God's truth. The Bible promises, believe in the Lord, your God, and you shall be established. Believe his prophets, and you shall prosper. Prosper. Second Corinthians, Chronicles 20.20. 20. God wants the very best for us. He wants us to have every advantage for these trying days in which we live. So he gives his people messages from beyond the stars, messages from his heart of love. It is so important that he identifies his last day people with primarily two characteristics in Revelation 12, 17. They keep the commandments of God and have the faith of and have the gift of prophecy. Would you like to be part of this special movement? Would you like to be blessed by this special gift God has given his people? I would invite you this evening to kneel with me as we pray. Our Father in heaven, thank you for the Bible. Thank you for the prophets. Thank you for salvation. Thank you for your messages through the prophets. Thank you for Ellen G. White. Thank you for the prophecies about the end time. Thank you for not letting us be lost by sending messages to us, Lord. We ask that you forgive us from all our foolishness, our sins in the past. Help us to appreciate and understand the gift of prophecy and to share the gift of prophecy with everyone. I pray that you bless the viewers and the listeners of this video. Bring them to you, Lord. Give us hunger and thirst for your word. Thank you for hearing our prayers. In Jesus' holy name we pray. Amen.